Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here in Washington, D.C., where we're going to be speaking about the role of American history on contemporary politics. And we have two wonderful guests with us today, Holly Brewer, who's, who's a professor at the University of Maryland, and Seth Radwell, who is the author of a book called American Schism. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. It's great to be here with you, Steve. Well, thank you both for coming. Holly, if we could start with you. Sure. Why is the period right after the founding of the Republic so important to contemporary politics now? Well, for two really fundamental reasons. First, it's in that period with the Declaration of Independence, with the Revolution, that American ideals were laid out in their clearest form, ideals that we've struggled to live up to. And second, because it's in that period, both on the state level and on the national level, that the foundation of laws under the United States, and especially the U.S. Constitution, were framed. And they still frame how we discuss and legitimate laws today. Seth, do you agree with that? Yes. I, for me, the period is so fundamental because it really provided the antecedents to why we're so divided today, which is what I investigated in my book. There were conflicting or contending views of what the American experience during the Enlightenment would be about, and it played out in this period. So it's very important to go back and understand what happened. So let's talk about that period a little bit. So my understanding of, I don't think any of us were alive in 1776, right. but in 1776, my understanding is that the, the Declaration of Independence was kind of a, a document of what we hoped life would be like. But then the Constitution came along and it wasn't quite as aspirational as the 1776 document. The way I describe it in American Schism is that 1776 was an idealistic period, a breaking away and declaring new rights. And the Declaration is fundamentally what, what's a radical Enlightenment document. You know, when Jefferson replaced life, liberty, and property with the pursuit of happiness, that was a bold claim. But once the war was over and practical considerations became roaring in, like how are we going to pay for the war? How are we going to get 13 very different colonies to have a foreign policy? It was these compromises that forced the more moderates who had experienced governing, the elites of the colonies, to make compromises. So that there was a big shift uh, across those 12 years between the, two, between the Declaration and the Constitution. And Holly, in your mind, is that 12-year shift still what we're living now? Well, can I go back and talk about whether I think that there is really a shift or ah, not? Fair and enough. so I would say even the Declaration was to some extent a compromise. So for example, on the question of slavery, and the extent to which slavery was wrong, there were, the original draft of the Declaration yeah. had clauses condemning slavery explicitly. Written um, by Jefferson. Written by Jefferson. Right. And they were excluded, I'm just gonna show one quick connection, they were excluded on the insistence of Edward Rutledge, and who basically indicated that South Carolina wouldn't sign on right. to the Declaration unless they were removed. It was his brother John Rutledge at the Constitution who did the same thing if slavery was not, I mean, if mm -hmm. slave trade weren't allowed at, le at least until 1807. So uh, there's compromises in both is what I was gonna say. And there's also radicalism in both. That said, I do agree there's some, there's some change over time. What does it mean for today? That's your other question. Well, before we even get back to that, I really think your point is really interesting. So, <clears throat> so how radical do you think that the original document was? The original declaration? Yes. I think it was still really radical because even though the explicit clauses condemning slavery were taken out, all men are created equal was still there and it wasn't exclusive. So right. it was just a little bit less explicit on the question of slavery. Um, See, I, I would argue that, and again, my, my feeling is that it was the supreme expression of the French radical enlightenment that there's this notion of an egalitarian society that comes out of the social contract thinkers. It was most, most purely expressed then. And, and the reason why it's important is because the moderates of the time, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, were very afraid of democratic rule. They were, they were really concerned about e egalitarian mob rule. Democracy meant demagogue back then. And so in the Constitution, they put strong guardrails against democracy. The only democratic element of the Constitution is the House. There's a strong executive. There's a Senate that at the time was appointed by state elites. Yeah. So, by state legislature. Yes. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of guardrails against this radical egalitarian enlightenment and more towards what 
would be the Locke, the, the Locke or the Montesquieu uh, aristocratic republic. Some people would argue that we're still debating some of those same points. Like if you look at today's United States Senate, and a senator from Wyoming has the same power as a senator from California or New York or Pennsylvania, some people would say that that's inherently anti-democratic. If you live in Wyoming, you have seven times the weight in national right. politics and both in both through the Senate and the, right. and the president that you do if you live in New York City, for example. Um, yeah, it's profoundly um, anti-democratic. I, I guess I would push back a little bit too, though, even on that question. Um, the Constitution purposely left unstated mm -hmm. what the qualifications were for voting, and right. that was partly because there were splits over radicals and conservatives, yes. and they left it up to the states. Right. Um, and I think part of the logic behind the um, certainly the Electoral College in the voting for president was also that because it was so difficult to travel at that time, and there was no television, which we're on now, or or radio, or or internet or easy ways to quickly communicate, there was a worry that people wouldn't be able to know who they were voting for um, and Absolutely. have any direct encounter with them. There's a travel issue, a communication issue. Right. And so that that was part of the justification of the initial, and so it wasn't just anti-democratic, okay. it was, it was yeah. practical concerns Good. So exactly. uh, that have now disappeared. There was also the big state, small state situation, right. which was made very acute by the fact that the Articles of Confederation had given one vote per state and so and those that's how the voting was done even at the constitutional convention so it was harder it was been hard to come up with a different norm i mean i think it's obviously it's high time when we consider the electoral college and even possibly the organization of the senate but why would let's say we were having this debate somewhere in wyoming why would people in wyoming support a reform of the senate or the electoral college that's the fundamental problem because to amend the Constitution, you yeah. have to get um, um, three quarters of the states and two thirds of both houses to approve, and and that's really unlikely for the small the states with lower population levels right. to a degree agree to give up their power. I'm surprised you didn't pick the Dakotas because the Dakotas were somewhat arbitrarily split into two states. Yeah. So my the what I say in American Schism is that the, yeah. the Dakotas together have a 38th the smaller, a 38th of the economy of California and of the population and have four senators as opposed to California's two, right? right? But, but I, I think one of the real questions is that, you know, throughout our history, there's been this pendulum-like swing between these visions of more popul a populism and an egalitarian elite society. And that goes back a lot to these discussions back in the 18th century. One of the reasons why I say the Federalist Papers is such an important work for citizens to read is because in many ways they argued about the pros and cons of this radical versus moderate enlightenment in the Federalist Papers. Like, like Madison 10 really delineates the notion of why what's what's the federal properties of the constitution and what's the what's reserved to the states and what's you know national so those those discussions are really interesting because they're relevant to some of the things we've been through many of the things we've been through I argue as a country mm -hmm. and i want to stop right there and point out that much was left up to the states in terms of yes. how radical the revolution was going to be and i think that's so understated so most of the really major reforms that were happening after the revolution were happening on the state level. We're talking reform of crime and punishment, right. reform of inheritance laws, um, property confiscations during the revolution yes. of loyalist property, um, slavery to the extent that things were really done on the question of slavery. It was done on the state level. Seven of the original 13 states took steps in the 20 years after the revolution to at least start on, on the road to gradual abolition. Right. That's where the rules about who could vote and extending the franchise, that's where they were mostly made. Um, I don't want to say it's all positive. There's also reactionary politics. But, but I, agree, I agree with what you're saying, but, but that, that, that's in the Jeffersonian model. But here you had Alexander Hamilton devising a federal system. I mean, he was on a different path. The Federalists were on a different path, right? I mean, one of the great examples that, that, that express this kind of two mindsets, in my view, is Shays Rebellion. So here is Daniel Shays, who fought in the war and is injured in 1787, I think. And the model... 10 years earlier was to overthrow the government. So they were gonna overthrow the government of Massachusetts because why? The Federalist scheme to tax the people to pay for the war was gonna make the New York bank uh, financiers rich. 
Well, so it was a it was a scandal, and Washington didn't have the right to an army because it was pre-constitution. But but it it flared up in that example, I think, of some of the forces, which again is one of the reasons I outlined it in in, in the book. Right. I mean, I would just 1787 Shays Rebellion is is Massachusetts yes. government. Yes, That's, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but it's still before the, the, yes. The, there's no federal government. There's no right. federal government. Um, but it was making the Eastern merchants in Massachusetts rich. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. And one of the real tragedies of Shays Rebellion is that there had been a lot of drought, uh, or a lot of poor, poor harvests right beforehand, and um, the Western Massachusetts um, couldn't, um, voters did, didn't pay, didn't deci decided not to send representatives that year okay. to the, in 1786 to the Massachusetts. Um, legislature because they were too poor I see. and so that was part of the law though it was the reason the law was passed it ended up taxing them so heavily, so heavily. that I meant see. that they were losing their estate their their farms which is why the rebellion happened in the first place well that's interesting because if you think about contemporary politics people would often argue that the people who don't make it to the room are often the people who are worse off after the uh, whatever settlement is, is resolved well, but it's, it's talking about contemporary politics, it's fascinating to me that we've talked ad nauseum about the January 6th rebellion on the Capitol, and we never mention either Shays or the Whiskey Rebellion. I mean, we have antecedents that are interesting, not that they're exactly the same, far from it, but they're interesting models. For, I feel like sometimes, beside being in a partisan bubble, we're in a time bubble, which you know, I so appreciate historians, because history is really relevant for some of the things that we face today, but yet we don't talk about it much. Yeah, you know, the right to rebellion is really crucial, but I think that's fundamentally different, partly because in Shays Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion, they were simply protecting their own homes and yes. their own areas, whereas in the case of the January 6th riot, right. they were coming to the Capitol. Well, just the whole question that Washington had a maneuver between, you know, which led to the Alien and Sedition Acts. I mean, there was a lot of anti-democratic, anti-declaration uh, things that happen after the first phase of our history, right? Um, so I just think it's interesting to understand, you know, where the, the right to rebel and to protest is, is sacred, but when do you have the right to overthrow the government? And what does that mean? Re remember that two of the things the colonists were so worried about in the revolutionary period was the right of a central power, Britain in this case, to raise taxes and impose standing armies. And two of the things that were forced into the Constitution was the power to tax and to raise an army. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting in, in that light. Yeah, although going back to Whiskey Rebellion, for example, George Washington very, very carefully made sure that the um, army that he raised was raised by the state legislatures because right. that's what was specified in the Constitution. Um, the right to rebellion is one of the really tricky things about the American Revolution. Right. And notice that even in the Declaration, that right was allowed only, quote unquote, after a long train of abuses that showed right. a we'll clear intent for tyranny. Um, and then that's what the most of the Declaration was about, that long train of abuses. So it had to be substantiated in this case with sort of 20 different yes. um, ways. Here's the evidence. So, um, yeah. and, and in a fundamental way too, I would say even the Revolution, to some extent, Britain brought it to them. They weren't bringing it to Britain, right? So. I, I think they were very conscious, even then, that the right to rebellion had to be carefully guarded, that it was something only to use really in a terrible situation right. as an act of desperation. It wasn't something to be used routinely or casually, otherwise you're facing permanent anarchy. Right. But I, I, still, I still think, though, in the, in the longer history of the world, it's just it's so amazing that this set of thinkers first of all, recognized inalienable rights in the early Enlightenment. And I mean, this was such a departure. I mean, the, I would argue that the, the Declaration of Independence is one of the greatest documents and expressions of humanity in our history because of, of the way it lays out, to your point, in an argument. It's basically saying men, all men are created equal with these inalienable rights. The government's installed by men to protect those rights. Consent. As, as soon as the government doesn't Consent do it, and here's a list, by the way, we have the evidence. So right. it's, a, it's, a, it's an enlightenment argument in a Cartesian fashion, almost, that lays this out. And I think the beauty of that is we as Americans don't cherish it enough, I guess is my, <laughs> is, 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 is how incredible that is. Let's say there's a student right now who's in the University of XYZ down the street, right. and there's a debate about the founding of the American Republic and whether it's radical or it's whether it's not. 
okay? And they say, well, okay, Steve, that's really interesting, but how does that apply to my life? How can I take these lessons from history and apply it to the contemporary political debates that, that, that are going on right now? So I would emphasize the idea that um, just government is based on the consent of the governed, which I, I mean, that, mm -hmm. yes. you, you kind of slid over that yeah, part right, of the right, right. declaration, right, right, right. but I think it's, it's one wonder. of the most important Which is part. Lockean, right? Which That's is Lockean, and, well, not just Lockean, this is, this is some of the big debates coming out of England's two revolutions yes. in the 17th century. And, and it's opposed to government based on divine right of kings yeah, or a natural sure. arist an aristocracy that's born to power. Um, and so I, I think one of the most fundamental ideas is this idea of consent. And the question then becomes, who can justify public consent? And John Adams has an amazing letter to James Sullivan in about May of 1776 after, after um, Abigail had written to him and said, what about women? Why can't they participate? In it? And Adams wrote back to her and kind of laughed, but then he wrote a serious letter to James Sullivan. And he said, those who are dependent on others cannot, should not be able to vote because they have no will of their own. And what did he mean by that? He's talking about children right. and the poor and women and anyone as a servant or who works for somebody else. He said, none of those should be able to vote because they're dependent. Why did he say that and how did he justify it? Part of the reason, the way he justified it was based on how voting was done then. Voting then was all oral. I see. So you yeah. would step up, so there's a wonderful account from Virginia of uh, the election actually of um, John Marshall before he was Chief Justice when he was elected to um, the House of Representatives. And the, the voter actually stood on the steps and was asked, who do you vote for? And Marshall was, <laughs> and the other candidate was there and they, and they said, hello, Mr. So-and-so, the sheriff, hey, you know, who do you going to vote for? And then when he voted, the person he voted for said, thank you very much, Josh. I remember that as a feather in my cap. You know? But imagine so if different. voting is oral, anyone who is dependent on anyone else can be well, It's public, and first it's of all. Probably like, like, just, you know, say you're my boss and I want to vote for someone. Right. You said to me, hey, you know, I really right. like John Marshall. I'm standing in front of you. Right. Who am I going to vote for if I really care, right? Or, or say I'm your tenant and I rent a house for me, which was very common then. Right, you're dependent or, on them. Or yeah, yeah, so, so, so I would emphasize that, that there is this radicalism. It's often tempered. People are concerned. You want right. also stability. Right. But the, to pay attention to the ideals there and decide where, where you stand in terms of solving these problems. So I told you, but Holly, you make a point that's so vital to Steve's question, which Steve asked, how is it relevant to students today? I mean, this whole fundamental notion of which I, I will talk about in American Schism, is government top-down? We're moving in a, in a world that's leading towards autocracies more and more. The question of whether government is top-down from some higher power, or it's a bottom-up thing instituted by men and consented to by the governed, it seems like a, a simple question, the, but the world is going uh, crazy over it today. I mean, the notion of what government is, my point being, I think students have to really understand, as Daniel Allen from Harvard talks a lot about, what it means to be in a democratic republic and what's involved in, in consenting to be governed. I mean, it's such an important idea. Well, let's, let's press on that a little bit. And so, so how can a student at Harvard or any other university right. say that I consent to, well, to something? So to me, one of the key things is recognizing that, that a democratic form of government is extremely difficult. That in, so, in some ways, edicts handed down by a, an autocrat, you follow them. I mean, it's, it's very efficient in a way. I mean, ch you know, China has, has had more prosperity for the, for the poor person in the last 30 years than maybe ever in their history. But here's the thing. To me, the democratic form of listening, of engaging and listening and solving problems publicly is, the, I guess the word I use in the book, which is, it's epistemologically superior, meaning that we learn. The whole, the whole premise of democracy is that we talk and listen and learn. And, the, and the, I think we've gone away from that because everyone's tweeting. <laughs> We're not, that doesn't count as real listening to me. So to the student at Harvard, it's to get up off your computer <laughs> and go talk to some Americans about their experience. <laughs> about in real, in real, in, in person. I don't know if you agree with this, but I think that that's really important that we've kind of lost sight of that. Uh, anyway, so I think that for students, it's really important. Do you agree with that, Holly? Well, there's several elements to what you said. So um, on the first one, whether autocracy is efficient, I think it can be efficient, but if it's really horrifying, yeah. when you're talking about 
you know, killing or punishing huge numbers of people, it becomes so yes, I, I would agree efficient, with that. depending on how you measure that. Um, in terms of how do you participate in a democracy, how do you give consent, I think it is important that people deliberate and that our educational systems teach people how to think uh -huh. and not just memorize how to, right. you know, what is the right answer on a multiple choice test, which we've been doing far too much of for the last 20 years. So I would emphasize that above all. Um, but I would also emphasize how important it is to participate in the democratic process and to make sure that it's as fair and inclusive as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And third, I would, I would, I think it's really important to challenge things, and I think through the internet can be a way, not yes. just through tweets, but through right. considered essays. Um, challenge things that you see as unfair to raise awareness about them because part of the problem with the American system as I see it is that sometimes the courts have too much power. The courts are, are making decisions over things that really the legislature should be making decisions over, not just adjudicating in a narrow way, but adjudicating in a broad, broad way. So if a student at the University of Maryland comes up to you and says, you know, I really like that particular lecture you gave the other day, I'd like to discuss that more. And you say, okay, well, here's some things to read, and then they come yeah. to see you. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to say, okay, well, I'm frustrated that XYZ court ruled a certain way. What do you want them to do? Do you want them to work for a campaign? Do you want them to write op-eds? What do you want them to do to engage? Uh, so first of all, I stay out, I mean, I say nonpartisan in terms of those kinds of questions, obviously. But, um, but that is the kind of thing I would encourage them to do. Um, and I have had students who went out afterwards and, and did things like that, became a public defender, for example, or um, you know, started being a, as somebody's chief of staff on a campaign. Um, so that, I mean, those are things to do. But um, in terms of history, cause I, I'm a history teacher. I teach you know, about two centuries ago. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I encourage them to really find the sources for themselves, too, not just use what I give them, yeah. but I show them how to find the evidence and to think through the debates and the struggles. Right. So, and that's what I would encourage them, encourage them to do about today. That's great. Yeah, I, I just had a talk with Next Gen Leaders in New York, a group of high school students who are interested in civics. And um, it's so interesting to hear them talk about these issues against the backdrop of the political debate today, which is, in my view, collapsed. That, you know, so so it, they, they come from an era where it's so easy to attack and to use passion as opposed to facts. And you know, I think core argument is really this type of deliberative process that you're talking about at, at university. Um, I think that's so vital to the future of our democracy. Well, it's interesting you say that. So when my uh, second book came out, I was uh, doing some talks and I went on the show, uh, show uh, not my own show, of course, and I was on another show. And, and basically the host said, well, you know, there's all this discussion about how universities are bad places and how universities are harming people. And so there was almost a discussion. I wanted to talk about how universities are helping people to promote a civic dialogue. But this guy was saying, well, that's interesting. Not really, it's, it's not really interesting because I'm questioning the role of the university in helping people to think through those issues in the first place. Right, right. Well, that's, that's what you're seeing today. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of discussion about that. But my, my view is that a lot of that is, is displaced. Of course, there is trends in terms of whether it's on the, on the left, cancel, what they call cancel culture, or on the right, this, this rejection of truth. I mean, there are f extreme forces that are at place uh, that have detrimental effects, let's say, on debate. But overall, 70%, my research shows that 70% of the Americans are part of what I call the frustrated majority, which believes a lot of those on, on the extremes are crowding out the, the, the fundamental rational notion of debate and discussion, which is so important. So we, but you hear about them all the time, because that's what gets clickbait on the, I mean, I get, we could debate on the internet what's positive and negative, but a lot of the commercial model that makes money on the internet is about what is the loudest, mm -hmm. in my and view. And what is the most extreme sometimes. Right, yeah. 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 Um, I think there's a lot more openness and fairness within the university than, than some people. I think mostly on the, I don't know, I think there's both people on both the far right and the far left who'd say that universities are too biased one way or another. Um, but certainly speaking for myself and my colleagues, we do what we can to meet the students where they are, to help them understand the material, to help them understand the material from different perspectives, from different sides, 
to investigate more, to dig, to, to answer, to learn to answer questions from them for themselves. Um, and I would say also um, to really think about the nature of evidence and how we know things. That's so interesting. I love that. I just I'm reading right now the Constitution of Knowledge by Jonathan Rauch. Have you guys heard of that I book? Read that. Oh, it's 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 trying to understand how you know. One of the things takeaways is that we forget sometimes that you don't need not only don't you not need certainty for knowledge, but to have knowledge you have to have uncertainty because it's about being open to being wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he talks a lot about how the development of, of knowledge, so it's a worthwhile book for your, for your listeners, I think. Well, speaking of not knowing, and so, so if we're having this discussion about what we know and what we don't know, I mean, we're still having debates 200 years later about what the founders actually meant by putting in a particular clause or not putting in a particular clause. You could, you could say that there's a reason why a student or an adult in the United States now is confused about whether or not that was an, an American notion or not. But, 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 he, but here's the thing to always remember, in my view. The founders meant for the Constitution to be a malleable document, changeable. There's a famous painting that was done in around the turn of the century that shows an image of, and it was during the Second Great Awakening, which that shows an image of God handing the tablets down to Moses as the Constitution, with the notion of being set in stone, set in, set in stone, and being the notion of it being handed down as opposed to being built up from the governed. It's so antithetical to what they meant. My point being, there was a revisionism that happened in the Second Great Awakening, where you know things were kind of set in stone and were were divine, and it repainted in some degree the period of our revolutionary history, which arguably was one of the most secular, as divine. And, and I think that that's unfortunate, because I think if you go back to what Benjamin Franklin said as he was leaving the Constitution, it's a republic if you can keep it. You know, I think they really thought it was going to change with the times. I think we only have another minute or oh, two sorry. left. No, no, that's fine. Uh, is there anything else that, that you each, either of you would like to say? I would say that there are things about the founding that are problematic, especially slavery. There are also high goals that relate to considered arguments about justice, and that those high goals are worth fighting for still, even if they weren't fully lived up to at the time because of practical compromises. Yeah, that's great. I, I would agree, concur with that. I, what I would say to people today is that and I, I talk about this a lot in American Schism, is to reject these extremes if you don't believe in them and claim your voice back. The fight on reason with reason. It, a lot of what you hear on the internet today, in Facebook or Twitter, seems crazy. And I argue that we need to fight that on reason with reason by bringing back our history, objective truth, it didn't completely disappear with the postmodern wave, you know, things like that. It's, it's, about, it's about being reasonable and thoughtful. That's a, a, an important element for what I, what I pr propose today. Well, thank you both. Thanks for having Thanks us, Thanks very much thank for you. having us. If you'd like to reach out to me at the show, please go ahead and send an email to highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.